Today, I'm actually going to go through a, a training PowerPoint that I made for uh, my consulting business, Tejas Lean. Tejas is not a misspelling, uh, despite what you may think. Uh, the word Texas derives from the word Tejas, which is a Native American uh, word for friendly. Uh, unfortunately, the history of Texas and the Native Americans is not as friendly as it could have been. But let's pass slightly over that uh, aspect. All right, so as I said, this is a presentation I've done for businesses and industry uh, to teach them about lean production. So I'm hoping that not only will you get a chance to see um, uh, the uh, presentation uh, uh, in the way that I do it and maybe take some hints from that, uh, but also hopefully pick up some ideas about lean production. Uh, if you are an industrial engineering major, this is a presentation you're going to see at other times uh, in lean production class, uh, for example. So. Anyway, uh, now ordinarily I would start by introducing myself, talking to the audience about what they expect to get out of this uh, uh, presentation. And then I would start with a hands-on uh, exercise where uh, uh, where I would um, uh, have uh, the traditional, uh, it's one of the traditional uh, exercises for lean production, uh, the paper airplane exercise. Okay, so ordinarily we would start with that. Uh, next semester, if you are in um, uh, lean production class, uh, we actually will do the whole uh, exciting uh, deal, exercises and all. Uh, but today, we're not uh, uh, obviously able to do that uh, because our time is too short. When I do this for business or industry, I budget two and a half to three hours and the presentation alone is about an hour and a half. All right, so traditionally we think of profit as something that we make by adding it on to the cost of doing business, making our products, delivering our services. But our, the lean view of profit is that we can make profit even as we reduce the cost uh, both to ourselves and to the customers. So this graph shows profit uh, going, uh, uh, staying steady uh, over time while the cost is going down. And over here we show the cost going down and profit rising from continuing to reduce the cost of delivering those goods or services. So when I say lean, what do I mean by that? Well, lean is doing more with less, using less time, less space, less human effort, less machinery, less material, and at the same time, still delivering what the customers value. 
So why do we want lean to uh, uh, be used? Well, we have one thing that we can never replace, and that is time. And I'm sure some of you in this class right now are thinking, yes, this is an hour and a half I'll never get back again. Once a second goes, it is gone forever. There's, there's no amount of money or effort that will bring it back. So time is irreplaceable. And lead time is the key to customer satisfaction. In other words, how much time between when they place an order and when they get their goods or their services. Uh, right? So if somebody comes to you and they say, hey, can you build such and such for me? And you say, well, yeah, you can have it in a year. They may just decide to go to the guy who said, no, I can have that for you next week. All right, so how do we, uh, how do we deal with that? Well, the key is waste elimination. That's how we make more profit without raising the price. Um, and there is an incredible amount of waste in all processes. Uh, even Toyota, the world champions of lean production, say they estimate they still have 20 to 30 percent of waste in their processes. Well, Toyota has been learning to be lean literally for over a hundred years. All right, so we have waste elimination, and the other part is continuous improvement. We always want to be improving what we do every day in every way. Yes, James. Okay, apparently he doesn't want to say anything. Um, so, we have five key principles in Lean. The first is that value is what the customers are willing to pay for, not what the engineers think should be in a product or a service, but what the customers are willing to pay for. A value stream is when we put together the steps that create and deliver that value to the customer. Our third principle is that of flow, where we work on one piece flow, one thing at a time that keeps moving through the system and, uh, without stopping and with no badging. Our pull means that we work on demand when we're needed, right? We don't start making a lot of stuff that we have no orders for. We only produce to the demand. And perfection, well, of course, there is no such thing as perfection. But that means that we relentlessly pursue continuous improvement in our processes. So to go into these in more depth, our first key principle is value. Uh, again, that is what the customers are willing to pay for. So value added as a result, is any activity, any service, any material that changes the form, fit, or function of the part, product, or service to make it what the customer wants. Non-value added is anything that does not add to that value that is desired by the customer. 
And we should always think of these activities in terms of eliminating them, simplifying them, or reducing them. All right, so when we think of value, things that are value added, customer service. The customers like it when they get service. Order entry, assembly, painting, cleaning, those are all value added, but never rework, never having to go back and fix something that we did wrong in the first place. Some ideas that are non-value added, well, incomplete information, right? If we don't have all the information that's needed, that's not value added. Entering, entering information in two places. If information has to go to two places, we need to make it automatic that when we put it in one, it goes to the other. Waiting whether that's people waiting or whether that's products waiting, waiting is a waste. Inspection, the idea that we have inspectors that go around and look at things and say, oh no, this doesn't meet the standards, whatever. We need to set up our processes so that we produce to the standard you can't inspect quality in. Transportation, just moving things around does not add value. Having inventory does not create value, that is non-value added. Having to search for things is non-value added. And especially rework. Rework is never value added. Sometimes it will end up being necessary, but it is never value added. All right, so we think of our wastes. Well, there's three kinds of wastes in lean, but the one we talk about the most is muda in uh, Japanese. Uh, lean production derived from the Toyota production system. So a lot of the terms that we use are Japanese terms. Although, interestingly enough, the fathers of Lean at Toyota say they got a lot of their ideas from Henry Ford. So what goes around comes around, I guess. All right, so the first kind of waste is defects. We don't pass on a problem to a customer, whether that customer is the next guy at the assembly line or the ultimate customer. Uh, overproduction is our next, uh, uh, is the next of our wastes. It costs money to build up inventory. And we don't want a lot of money sitting around in our factory or in our warehouse or in our business. We want to be producing at the rate people are buying. Waiting. <coughs> Waiting is a waste. We want one piece flow, one deal with one thing at a time uh, to be the most efficient. Non-value processing. We don't want to uh, do more than the customer wants, right? So we don't want to uh, gold plate something when they don't care about that or have to do rework. When we talk about transportation, of course we're going to have to transport things from one place to another. Uh, but we want to move on the shortest path. 
I have worked in facilities where they have automatically guided vehicles that are essentially giving the parts a tour of the factory. Well, what good does that do anybody? Injury is a waste. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, the people who work for us and our customers are safe, that they're not going to be injured. Injury costs us a lot of time, money, effort, and it's almost impossible to actually figure out how much that costs in total because a lot of those costs are hidden. Uh, motion, we always want to produce with the least movement. Um, there's an old, old TV show from the very early days of uh, uh, network TV called The Honeymooners, where Jackie Gleason and Art Carney played the two principal characters. And Art Carney is a funny, funny guy. If you ever get a chance to see a movie or a show that has him in it, um, uh, you should do that. But, for example, if he would sit down to play the piano, right, first he would stretch and, oh, 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 he'd get his fingers all worked out, and then it'd look like he's going to play, oh, but no, he stretches again. Well, for comedy, extra motion is, uh, can be funny. In real life, we want as little motion as is needed to do the job. And energy, the resources and disconnects in a process can absorb an awful lot of energy. That can be electrical energy, it can be hydraulic or pneumatic energy, it can be human energy. If a worker has to get up and go ask the boss what he has to do, that's already a loss of energy and time. Now one thing that we have to be careful of is waste is always disguised as honest work that has to be done. Uh, and in fact in consulting in business and industry I've had people argue with me, oh, no, no, we have to do that. We've been doing that for hundreds of years. And, of course, you have to ask, well, why? Sometimes there's an answer to that. Sometimes not so much. All right, so our next key principle is that of the value stream. Uh, Again, that is the steps that are creating and delivering our value to our customer. So that can be from the time we have raw material to delivery and installation or any portion of that. So we include value-added steps and non-value-added steps within that paradigm. When we're looking at the value stream, we want to see what is the flow of material, what is the flow of information, what are the value-adding steps, and what are the non-value-adding steps. Those are opportunities for improvement. All right, so flow, we want our product or our service to go through the process one at a time without uh, stopping or being batched. So one piece flow is always the ideal that we go for. When we talk about mass production, that moves the products in batches, but batches wait while they're in the way and they're hiding defects inside the batch. 
So one of the reasons that we use one piece flow is to reduce errors, right? And you'll notice that we illustrate the idea of flow with a picture of a stream. All right, so our next principle, our fourth principle, is that of pull. Pull means that we only produce to the demand that we see. So we have a trigger so that we're on demand when it's needed. When we produce to a trigger that keeps our inventory low, and pull helps us pace our production to customer demand. All right, so uh, you'll notice here we have less finished products on this end of the assembly line. And our finished goods are here at the end of the assembly line. Right, so in this case, these guys are making little plastic snowmen. All right, so it's not rocket science, but, uh, but it's just an illustration for our evil purposes. All right, so we sell one of our plastic snowmen, and that means that now this is an empty Kanban and that signals our pink worker that he needs, is he pink? Oh, he looks more purple uh, here. All right, great. Um, that signals him to grab this uh, almost completed snowman, do his work, and move it over here. Right? So our finished product is sold. The pink worker finishes the product. Uh, that means that now this Kanban is empty. And that signals our blue worker to take this snowman that's in process and uh, to, uh, uh, to do his part of the work. Um, uh, uh, so that... Uh, it, so that it ripples down the line. All right, part of that pre key principle of pull is not everything can be um, not everything can be um, sold like we finish one, we wait for somebody to show up, right? Toyota, who I've used as an example quite a few times, they're going to sell millions of cars this year. They can't wait for somebody to show up at the factory and say, oh, I want a green Corolla. There's one right over there. No, of course not. Uh, so they have to work on an estimate of their yearly demand. So... One of the things that we often do is we work off a uh, demand uh, uh, and look at um, how does that uh, affect the amount of time and the amount of effort that we have to put in to make the product that customers want. So we use the term tact time. And strangely enough, tact is the German word for musical beat, like a drum beat. Uh, how a German word got into this whole thing, you've got me, since most of the words that we use in, uh, in uh, lean are Japanese words. So... Uh, so when we know the demand, we can synchronize our process. We calculate our tack time 
by saying that is the time available divided by the demand, right? So we would say that we need to make something every, uh, we need to make uh, uh, every two minutes per unit, we need to have, have made a unit. Yes, I'm sorry, what was that question? Well, damn it. If they won't ask the questions, I don't know what to do. I think it was the sneeze. A sneeze? Sounded like it. <laughs> damn it, we don't allow sneezing here. Um, okay, I'm, I'm lying. You know, that's one of the contradictory things about uh, COVID. Here we are in allergy season, and we're supposed to be watching people for sneezing and coughing. Don't okay, great. Yeah, don't, that's going to work out well. Don't forget the flu. Um, so, anyway. Uh, all right, so I'm going to do a real super easy example. Uh, the example is we have to produce 20 blivets in a day. All right, so who can tell me what a blivet is? A blivet is a technical term that means 10 pounds of horse manure in a five pound bag. All right, so the amount of time we have in our day, we're going to work one shift. So an eight hour shift is 48 minutes. Uh, so 48 minutes, we have uh, two 15 minute breaks. So we subtract 30 minutes uh, minus 50 minutes for setup in the morning and clean up at night. All right, so that leaves us with 400 minutes per day. The time it takes to make a blivet, uh, for argument's sake, is 40 minutes. All right, so when we calculate this, the tack time, that's 400 minutes divided by 20 blivets equals 20 minutes per blivet. Uh-oh. I can see that. Uh, all right. Uh, one of the things I do when I rehearse is I often stop and fix problems in my presentation. Today I'm not rehearsing, but um, I want to give you an idea of the rich fullness. All right, now it takes 20 minutes, we have 20 minutes per blivet to deliver them, but it takes 40 minutes per, uh, uh, to make a blivet. So what do we do? Well, we have two workers that each do 20 minutes work on every bit uh, blivet. So easy peasy, lemon squeezy, as the old saying reminds us. Now, um, Obviously, this is kind of a silly, frivolous example, um, uh, but this is exactly how the calculation is done. All right, so the last of our key principles is perfection. Perfection means that we pursue relentless, continuous improvement. Uh, and uh, and so we always should be looking at our processes and saying, what can we do to make this better? 
we are never finished with improvement. Um, you know, as I said, Toyota has been working on improvement for, um, depending on what, when we mark the beginning of the Toyota production system, either since the late 1940s, uh, which at this point would be almost 80 years, or over 100 years if we go back to um, uh, E.G. Uh, Toyota, who uh, in, started introducing improvements and ideas at the Toyota Loom Company, as it was then. When we start improving someplace that hasn't had improvement for a long time, the big improvements are going to be early. I have gone into shops and worked with them where on the very first event, we improved their efficiency 50% or even more than 50%. Our more refined improvements are going to come with experience, right? As we go along, we're going to still be improving, but we're not going to have those huge gains in efficiency. We're going to have much more modest gains in efficiency. So when we're talking about lean manufacturing or lean production, well, first of all, we need a shared vision by all the employees. Um, that's got to be from the guy who is the CEO down to the custodians that are sweeping up uh, uh, and mopping and cleaning. Uh, everybody has to be in on that. So everybody has to be working together on this with management support and employee involvement, right? There can be no such thing as, uh, oh, well, we're going to improve the employees, but in management, we're so perfect, we don't need any, uh, uh, any improvement. I have actually worked with people that would say stupid things like that. And it never worked out well. Again, we have to remember, value is defined by the customer, right? All too often, the engineers want to define value, right? So as a result, I once had a, uh, a, uh, uh, VCR uh, DVD player and the remote had must have had at least 70 buttons on it right and I'm looking at this and I'm like what do all these buttons do what the hell right because I ended up using like uh, uh, five or six Right? So there were a lot of buttons there, and every button had a second function. Right? So it was really like 140 functions, not 70. Okay. <coughs> Maybe if you're a professional video engineer uh, at a TV station, you need all of those functions. But the average consumer? No. They don't. I contrast that with the first time I bought a, a smart TV, and it has like 10 buttons. Uh, even at that, I, do, I have never used all 10 buttons, uh, right? Because what they did was they said, you know what, it's a smart TV, it's got computer capabilities, we'll put the menus on the TV, and they, they press the button to access the menu, then they scroll down to what they want, etc. Right? So it goes back to the old saying, 
in, uh, uh, in industry, at some point you have to shoot the engineers and put the product into production. Because engineers have a, t a tendency to fool around and want to add things because they're really neat. You don't necessarily need them, but it's neat to have that. Uh, so, all right, anyway, uh, something to keep in mind. Uh, again, our lean manufacturing, lean production, we want waste elimination in the processes. Anytime we can get rid of waste, we are going to make more money. We want to build a continuous improvement culture. And we do that with quantifiable goals, right? We never say something like, oh, we want to be better. Well, what do we want to be better at? Do we want to be better at production, sales? How much better do we want to be? Do we want to have fewer quality defects? Right? So we have to build a lean culture within our company, our organization, our business. The hallmarks of a lean culture are, first of all, we have to be willing to change. Right? If we can't have a lean culture where we have a uh, a person or a bunch of people that say, nope, not changing. I've done it this way for hundreds of years. I'm going to keep doing it. We have to be able to communicate the vision that is driving our lean, uh, uh, our lean efforts. And along the way, we have to build the trust of the workers, the customers, and the suppliers. Um, if our workers don't have trust, uh, trust for example that if they improve things they won't be fired, uh, then what is their motivation to improve? They have no motivation in that case. They know that if I improve things, and we don't need as many people working on the assembly line, I might get fired. Well, in that circumstance, people aren't going to work against their own best interest and work to get fired. So we want to empower and motivate the people we're working with. Empower them to make changes, to try things and motivate them to do that. And we want to support action. Anyone that thinks that we're going to try things and it's always going to be better, it's always going to improve things, that's more delusional thinking. It ain't going to happen that way. We are going to sometimes have failures sometimes even spectacular failures. But we want to support people acting and trying to make things better. All right, now this is a very standard kind of an idea when we talk about lean production, is the house of lean or the house of lean production. Our roof is that our focus is on the customer. We want low price, high quality, and a short lead time. All right. That roof is supported by two pillars. Just in time, which is the idea that we deliver the right parts at the right time in the right quantity, kitted and ready for production to the workers or the assembly line. And Jadoka, which 
is kind of an umbrella for all kinds of ideas. One is autonomation. Autonomation was invented by E.G. Toyota at the Toyota Loom Company, which is the idea that if a machine starts making a mistake, it should stop itself. Right? So he invented, uh, Toyota started out as a loom company. In other words, they were weaving cloth. Uh, not the Navajo way, the machine way. The thing is, if a, a thread broke, it would create what they call a smash, where the cloth would be messed up and you'd have to stop and restring the machine and uh, and the smash part would just be ruined and you'd have to throw it away. So he invented the idea that he would have a little sensor attached to every thread. Uh, and if one of those threads broke, that sensor would stop the machine. So you wouldn't get a smash, you could, you could stop and fix it and uh, uh, and then start the machine again. Another idea is mistake proofing. And the third is visual management. And we'll talk a bit about them, uh, more about them later. So that's, this rests on a foundation of 6S. 6S is the idea that we keep a neat workplace where everything is easy to find and to access. And of course, level work production means everybody's doing about the same amount of work, right? It's not a thing of Mr. Donahue is killing himself and the rest of us are taking it easy and drinking coffee. And I'm not going to go through the middle part since this isn't the production class. All right, so uh, we use all kinds of different uh, tools and events within Lean to make things more efficient. 6S is always where we start. That is always our foundation for further improvement. Have you ever gone to somebody's shop and it's just a mess, there's stuff on the floor, there's a bunch of stuff lying around. There's dust on all kinds of things. Well, it's hard to work in a circumstance like that. Right? If we clean things up uh, and we make things more organized, it's easier to work. In some of my early work uh, making places more efficient, uh, I didn't know about lean production at that time, but I did understand the basic principle of success, which is if you're clean and organized, it's more efficient to work. All right. A Kaizen event is a focused improvement event. A total productive maintenance is the idea that we do the maintenance on equipment so that it's ready to use when it's time to use it. A 3P event is about redesigning our processes and our spaces to make them more efficient. Standard work is the idea that everybody does the same work the same way, right? Everybody doesn't have their own way to do it. Everybody works the same way. Value stream mapping is something that we, uh, that we do in lean production so that we know where the value is added. Uh, listen, you dogs, stop barking. You're ruining the presentation. Uh, and... Uh, the SMED actually stands for a single minute ex exchange of dies. The idea that we learn how to change from making one product to
to another very quickly so that we can be more flexible in our production methods. All right, so I kind of skipped lightly over Kaizen events because there's actually four things we might be uh, doing in a Kaizen event. One is doing 6S. And as I said, that's got to be the first thing that we do all the time. Um, so we reduce to the necessary items. We have visual management. In other words, we can see everything that we need. And we reduce the amount of work in process. Standard work. Again, we will always want the same work to be done the same way every time. One piece flow, we work on getting things to flow smoothly through the system. And uh, working on the pull system, we want to have first time quality, in other words, not have to do rework on items that were done wrong. Uh, we want uh, everything to be just in time. Uh, the idea of um, working within our tack time and having everything available needed at the time it's needed. And link the steps together. All right. So, 6S, we often use uh, the old motto that your grandmother may have used, a place for everything and everything in its place. And we very often illustrate that with fire engines. Why a fire engine? Because on a fire engine, Everything has a place that it goes, and it only goes there, right? You don't want to roll up to a fire and have somebody go, Hey, George, uh, where did you put the two-inch hose? No. You've got to have everything exactly in the same place every time because people's lives are at stake. A few seconds can make the difference between saving somebody and them dying a horrible death. All right, so our six S's, first of all, is safety. Uh, I should say, uh, Hiranu, the, uh, uh, the Japanese inventor of six S, he actually invented what we call 5S. Uh, and he, uh, because he did not include safety. Uh, he said, everybody should know that you have to be safe. Here in America, a lot of times workers are very complacent and we need to particularly keep an eye on, um, on the safety aspect as we are doing a 6S event. Okay, so safety means we fix any unsafe conditions we find, right? There's things on the floor you might trip over. We get rid of them. We either put them up where they can be used or we totally get rid of them, whatever's needed. Uh, right, we got... Uh, uh, a bare electrical wires, we call in the electrician, we get that fixed. We sort everything in the shop, in the workstation, whatever. Right? We pull it all out and we look at it with an eye for what is needed and what's not needed. I, I should say, in sorting, a friend of mine did a 6S event uh, at a um, uh, casting shop. 
they, when they did the sort step, they were pulling out things that were wrapped in newspaper from 1969. This was only like 15 years ago, right? So that stuff had been sitting on a shelf somewhere for at least 30-some uh, years. All right. So we've separated what's needed from what's not needed. Then we straighten where we organize what is needed into how we can use it the most efficient. Sweep is the step where we clean up and we make it visual, right? So instead of hiding uh, tools in a drawer, we make like a pegboard where everything is hanging on the pegboard and you can see it immediately when you need it. We step standardize where we establish who is going to do what, when are they going to do it. Uh, part of this is sometimes uh, you'll make a schedule of, all right, uh, George, you're going to clean, uh, you're going to sweep up the shop on Monday. Uh, Melvin, you're going to sweep it up on Tuesday. Um, uh, Victoria, you're going to sweep on, on Wednesday and so on down the line. And then sustain, right? We want to keep that order that we've created and improve on it. One thing I'll tell you about a 6S event is it's very rare that on the first time you do it, you create such a perfect system that it never has to be fixed. No, what happens is a lot of times it'll go back to uh, a more chaotic state, but that's fine. You come in and you do another 6S event. Uh, some consultants that I know say that when you do lean production, it may be as long as two years that all you're doing is 6S events in different shops, offices, uh, 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 storerooms, etc. Uh, okay, well this slide isn't as good for uh, class, obviously. All right, so visual management, to go a little more deeply into that, is the idea that we see the information we need the tools we need, the parts we need, etc. So this is a sign that I uh, took a picture of at a place where I was uh, consulting. Because this is perfect. This gives you all the cautions for going into their shop. Right? So they were dealing with large pieces of steel that they were cutting and welding and, uh, and generally putting together to make drilling rigs. Okay, so they tell you what are the safety, uh, uh, personal protective equipment you need. They caution you it's a welding area, uh, that there is an overhead crane, so you might get hit by a big piece of metal if you don't pay attention, uh, and that forklifts are moving things in and out. So part of it is safety instructions. Uh, it might be operating instructions. This picture down in the bottom right corner is actually a coffee maker that I had at a house uh, I used to own. And uh, the thing was, it was really a confusing thing to use, right? I learned how to use it 
But then when I would have friends come over and stay the weekend, whatever, uh, they would be trying to make coffee and we'd end up with coffee all over the floor and oh my God. Uh, so I went through and I put instructions on it about where to, uh, how to do the different things. Like here on the basket, it says push the basket in firmly. Right? Because if you didn't put it all the way to the back, that was one of those spill the coffee all over the place. Uh, right? It told you where to find things you needed and so on. This actually is from that same house. I went through and I labeled um, not only what every light switch uh, and, uh, did, uh, but how much energy each of them used, uh, right? Now, one of the reasons I, I went through and I labeled everything was because whoever had wired that house, it made no sense at all. Uh, you would have, uh, for example, you'll notice this one says that it's the porch light and the kitchen overhead, right? But this is like way away from both of those. <laughs> so. So people would just go around randomly flipping switches trying to find lights in my house. Uh, and uh, uh, this actually is also a picture from that same house. I started using different colored baskets to separate my laundry. Because uh, I noticed when it was laundry day, I would just have a huge pile of laundry, and then I would have to spend time sorting the laundry before I could even start uh, doing any. By having different laundry baskets, what that allowed me to do was say, oh, wait, the whites here are at the top of the basket. It's time to do a load of whites. Okay, I do not know why it just did the same slide again. And again, oh, okay, because I was going to change that. All right, well, I won't do that now, uh, considering the short amount of time we have. All right, one thing that we do with visual management is we have production control boards. That is the idea that at one glance, you can see what is the status of different jobs. So in this case, on the left, uh, we have a, an all-day job, uh, something that has to be done. And each of the little cards, whether it's blue or orange, represents a little sub-job that has to be done. So you have jobs for mechanic A, jobs for mechanic B, and jobs for the electrician, uh, right? And it says what hour they should be done. But you have, always have a place where you can write down problems, right? Now this is a, a really complicated one. Uh, usually a production control board is more like this one on the right hand side, the widget assembly, where the daily goal is to make 48. You just mark off as you make each one, and you have a little place to put down what, uh, what problems you're encountering uh, during the day. Right? But um, but you can use a production control board for all kinds of things. For example, I have a production control board on my washing machine. Because there are certain things that go in the washing machine that I don't want to go into the dryer. Things like hats. Don't want my hats to go to the dryer. They never fit right after you do that. 
Uh, my wrist braces, don't want those to go in the dryer. Uh, let me think. Uh, my sister made me put bras on there. Uh, apparently those need to air dry. Uh, or she thinks they need to air dry. I don't know. Um, um, I uh, don't ordinarily wear bras, as you can imagine. Uh, uh, right? So I've got a production control board right there. I put a hat and two braces in the washing machine. I move a little magnet over that's into a column. All right, hat, I put it in one. And then I've got two braces, I've moved that over to two. I've also used a production control board for knowing which cats are outside. So I'll have every cat has his little name, and it says in or out, and I move the magnet according to uh, where they are. Right, so it can be a very useful thing. Uh, you, uh, you see them a lot in offices, right, where they'll have an in-out board, um, you know, oh, okay, the CFO is out, uh, and sometimes you'll have a little place on the side where they write conference or something like that. All right, so standard work, we want work done the same way every time. All the work, all the steps are always done in the same order. All work is to the same standards and all work with the same methods. I uh, actually was doing a standard work event with uh, a uh, transmission shop at uh, the Corpus Christi Army Depot. And, uh, and one thing that I found out very early was everybody was doing it their own way. Right? So I went to the technical manual, which is the official book of rules about how you take things apart, put things together, and I copied down the steps from there, and I went around and I showed it to each transmission team, right? And some of them looked at it and they go, yeah, that's how I do it. But others are like, what are you, crazy? You can't put a transmission together that way. It won't work. Oh, okay. So these other guys doing it that way must be crazy. Uh, all right, so we worked through it to get everybody working the same method all the time because one of the problems they were having was there was a high rate of failures of the transmissions when they would send them to the, the test cells, right? These were transmissions for helicopters, and as you can imagine, you don't just stick that in the helicopter and say, boy, I hope this works. No, you've got to know that it's going to work. So, uh, so after they would be rebuilt, they would have to go to a test cell where they would uh, test them under simulated conditions. All right. So standard work can, uh, instructions, very often it's some kind of a label on, uh, on the device, right? It might be a very simple label. It might be uh, uh, kind of complicated. So for example, here's another shot of that coffee maker I had, uh, right, that tells you where things are and, uh, and what they do. Um, uh, this is actually from an old washing machine that I had um, uh, a long time ago, right, where it went through all 
how you use the washing machine. Now, I kind of wonder about that because um, it was an old washing machine. I mean, I had this when I was in uh, Ohio and it was probably, I don't know, 10 or 15 years old then. But surely people knew how to use a washing machine by then. I mean, my washing machine now doesn't have instructions on it. And it's a much more complicated machine than this one. Okay, uh, sorry, that's, I guess, a little editorial comment there. So, the standard work instructions, depending on how complicated the job is, uh, we can actually have a binder or a check sheet that has the steps and how to do them. Uh, these two steps here are actually from a binder that I made um, uh, while consulting in industry about how, uh, how to do the process on this one little round part here. Uh, right? You had to set it up in the CNC machine uh, a certain way. You had to use the indicator on the, uh, on the little jig so that the CNC machine knew where it was so it would know where to start. So you had to do it in the groove here and you had to do it in the center hole of the, uh, uh, of the part so that the machine could locate it in space. And there was a couple more steps and then you just push the button and the machine would do everything. Right? But they kept having problems because people weren't setting up uh, doing the uh, doing the part right, right? So we started creating these binders for every different part they had to do that had to, had a step on every page, or I think maybe these were both on the same page, something like that. I don't remember now. All right, another part of standard work is kidding. Uh, if we create kits so that you have exactly the right amount of parts, that can be helpful. Uh, otherwise, you get a situation where you might have too many parts, not enough parts. Uh, so, um, So creating a kit, uh, it, um, it makes it super easy, right? So the kit has to have everything needed for the task. The kits have to be arranged in the correct order. And because most people are right-handed, we usually have a kit work from right to left. If we have to have multiple layers, the first items are on the top layer, second items are on the next layer down, and etc. Uh, when I was telling you about working in the transmission shop, uh, one day uh, they said, you know what, we're going to have to uh, uh, use a kit for this. And I was very excited. Oh, man, a kit. Uh, that's a sign of organization I haven't seen from these guys. They get out this giant brown paper bag and they dump it out and all it is is a bunch of parts sitting in a bag. And it's like, what the hell is this? This isn't a kit. But I said that to myself. I didn't want to insult my compañeros there. Okay, spaghetti charts. This looks familiar.
Um, can we help you, sir? There you go. Air purifier. Okay, fantastic. You request it for air purifier? Yes, sir. What do you want me to set it Would you put it in that room that's right behind this? All right, so here we see our guy, he's going around, he's doing his thing, uh, making everything happen. Uh, Y'all have already seen this, so I'm just going to skip to the end. Thank you very much, sir. You're welcome. Uh, all right, so the idea of point of use, and man, we are running low on time here. Uh, point of use is that everything is where it needs to be used. Uh, I have had uh, shop managers, uh, uh, directors, etc. argue with me, oh, it's only a few steps. Yeah, but he spends 30 seconds on walking over there, getting what he needs, coming back. This time, he spends 30 seconds. Uh, I mean, pretty soon we're talking uh, minutes of time wasted, then hours of <coughs> time wasted. Uh, so, uh, the idea is that our tools, equipment, forms, whatever, are in the place that they're used. <coughs> Uh, sometimes we need to have equipment in more than one place. Uh, having one piece of equipment uh, for everybody that needs one is a, one idea. If it's really expensive, arrange it so the equipment is in the middle of the people that need it. Uh, I, I mentioned a uh, a shadow board earlier, and I've got a very crude illustration here of one uh, where uh, you have the tools up on a pegboard kind of arrangement so that they are, it's not only visual, we see where the tool is, but we also see what one is missing. Uh, here's my coffee maker, and with it are all the things you need for coffee below. The coffee filters, coffee, the grinder for the coffee beans, uh, sugar, uh, everything except uh, uh, milk or, or half and half, whatever you like to have in your coffee uh, in that way. Uh, it seemed wasteful to have a little refrigerator right there when the actual refrigerator was like two steps behind there. Okay, oh, and the one-step rule is the idea that you shouldn't have to take more than a half a step or a step to get what you need as you're working. Uh, all right, so ergonomics is the study of our body while we work. And... It is a huge field, and I don't have time to go into everything involved in that. So we're going to cut it down to the very bare essentials here. First of all, your strongest between your shoulders and your knees. Uh, right? You don't want to be picking things up from way overhead. You don't want to be picking things up from the floor. And the more weight there is, the closer we want it to our natural standing knuckle height, right? Which is going to be just below our waists. We want to minimize the amount of reaching people do and minimize the amount of twisting that they have to do.
and pardon me while I make another correction here. And we get into value stream mapping. All right. Um, from here on out, uh, there is a lot more information. And you know what? Uh, we've really <laughs> run out of our class time. All right. So I'm going to post this video. And I want you to look at it even if you saw the class today, because I'm going to put the quiz 10 questions there. I'll have a couple of questions with it. Uh, so take a look at it and uh, uh, send me an, uh, an email answering the questions. Are there any questions at this time? Okay, well, thank you very much. And I will talk to you again on Monday morning. Have fun. So you say you're going to post the quiz? Today? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll post it. Okay. Victoria, have you got a couple of minutes? Yes, I do. Okay. Uh, I want to show you where your grade is sitting right now. Okay. My brain is not sitting anywhere right now. <laughs> so sorry to hear that. Me too. Now I pulled my back, so it took me a long time to come in. Yeah. Ergonomics. <laughs> uh, well, you know, that actually can happen. Uh, a friend of mine, we did a big job. Um, uh, we did a big job where we had had to unload uh, like uh, uh, five trucks, oh, wow. uh, put up the set, uh, do the show, load it mm -hmm. back. So he does all of that, no worries. Then uh, he went home. And when he was reaching in the refrigerator to get the eggs, oh, that's man. when his back attacked him. <laughs> Just that one wrong move. Okay. Is it in your office or? Yeah. Okay. Yes, here. Let me. Oh, okay. Yeah, take your time. There's, there's, <laughs> there's no broken leg panic.